I want to just address. Um, first, I'm Mike Conway, I'm the Director of Plan Giving at the Portland State University Foundation. Um, and it's my great pleasure to be here. I, I love these events, and I only wish I could have seen you all in person. Many of you I do know, and some of you I don't. Um, but uh, the world is, is, is a changing world around us, and uh, it's such a perfect time to actually hear from Dr. Nissen. So this will be a pretty impactful experience for us all. Um, so now, without further ado, it is with great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Laura Nissen, a social work professor professor, leader, researcher, and activist focused on innovation in the public sector, in human services, equity work, human rights, and social justice issues. Dr. Nissen is a founder and former national program lead of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation initiative called Reclaiming Futures. She also has a scholarly interest in the topic of arts and social change and is part of an international learning collaborative of social work researchers active in this emerging space. She has brought futures thinking and frameworks to the National Association of Deans and Directors of School of Social Work. And as a faculty member at PSU for over 20 years, Dr. Nissen leads a newly formed university-wide futures initiative at her own Portland State University in Oregon. To grow uh, an interdisciplinary campus-wide or sightfulness to advance and protect future-ready public higher education for an increasingly diverse student body. She has an undergraduate degree in the Met from the Metropolitan State University in Denver and both an MSW and a PhD from the University of Denver. She currently lives in Washington with her husband, Don, where she is a book binder and a calligrapher. And she just jumped into the world of tiny poultry with five little chickens and three little ducks, which she showed us the cutest video before all this started. So hopefully she could share that again. Um, <laughs> Take it away, Dr. Nissen. Thank you very much for being here. Hi, everybody. Good to be with you. Uh, happy uh, Thursday, I believe it is. Um, wow, a, a horn. I, I live out in the country and somebody's horn is going off. That's too funny. Um, I'm thrilled to be with you today. Thank you for being such um, amazing contributors and, and community members for PSU. Um, and uh, I am happy to share futures thinking with you. Um, I think we're all doing a lot of futures thinking right now, uh, whether we call it that or not. As we watch the news, as we imagine what in the world is going to happen next, I think this is part of all of our lives in kind of a new way. And one of my favorite futurists that I hang out with, his name is Jake Dunnigan, he works for the Institute for the Future. He said, um, often you know the biggest challenge futurists have is getting people to take them seriously <laughs> um, to take these ideas seriously no futurist is having a hard time getting people to take them seriously right now it is uh everybody is worried everybody's imagining everybody's trying to get a handle on what happens next and um i certainly feel like uh, my passion for this work probably started when i was a little girl i mean i've always been really interested in the future um, but it was only, it's only been the last 20 years or so that I actually knew there was a type of practice, futures practice, that's an emerging social science, that it's interdisciplinary, that it's global, um, that there's a literature, a social science literature that goes along with it, et cetera. So I'm excited to share it with you today. And then we'll, um, I'm going to talk for about a half an hour and then we're going to have a little bit of Q and A and just discussion. Um, so I'll just jump right in. So first of all, let's just all take a deep breath. Uh, and at the time that I made this slide, uh, I, I was thinking a lot about COVID-19, obviously. We were all thinking about that. Increasingly, I'm hearing in the, the Futures Dialogue a lot of discussion about the dual pandemics of, of COVID-19 being one of them, but sort of a, a, a new awakening of racial injustice as the other pandemics, sort of these dual pandemics. There will be a post-COVID world, and hopefully we can envision a world in which um, racial justice um, kind of gets to a new level in our world and in our country. Um, the, the point of futures work is to learn together, to learn towards um, the worlds that we want to co-create. And that means wading into some fascinating and potentially uncomfortable uh, kinds of topics and issues. For now, we'll just sort of focus on COVID. Um, uh, futurists are asking a lot of questions about how COVID-19 will change the world. How will it change us? History, uh, and, and history is a, a 
hugely important thing to futurists because history is full of patterns. Um, history tells us that pandemics change it. H how will um, this time change the ecosystem we live and practice in? What kind of world do we want to go back to? I just saw an article that said COVID-19 is going to change everything. <laughs> Well, that's interesting. What do we mean by that? I mean, and we're seeing a lot of articles like that. And who gets to decide that? What choices will we have? How will COVID-19 change us individually and in communities around the world? How will it expand us, evolve us, strengthen and challenge us, improve us? Uh, how will it threaten us? What will it force us to do? And how do we envision uh, what our evolution might look like to best uh, fit the times that we live in? How can we start imagining and preparing for our role in recovery? There'll be a need for healing like nothing we've ever experienced in our lifetimes. So are we ready for that? And then you could ask the exact same questions sort of about this racial justice moment that we're having um, in the United States right now. How will it change the world? Um, how will this kind of movement moment change history? Um, and all these same questions uh, apply. I love this quote by futurist uh, Stuart Candy, the greatest existential challenge facing the human species can in part be traced to the fact that we have underdeveloped practices for thinking possible worlds out loud. At the end of the day, futures practice is about really providing an architecture and a set of tools to help people explore the future and explore the kind of power and agency they have to co-create the future that they desire. So futures thinking is really um, not just about imagining futures, although that's part of it, but really thinking about pathways to either creating or preventing. What it has to offer the world right now is connecting the past, the present, and what comes next. Learning from the past, making sense of a lot of turbulence as we deal with what's going on right now, and then connecting both of those to an arc of meaning and the choices we have about what happens next in the world. A lot of futures thinking is about unlearning uh, our thinking about what is and isn't possible. Uh, the veil between these things is especially porous right now. And I say that to say that I've been on a number of futures calls where we've discussed the term impossible. Things we would have thought were impossible <laughs> six months ago are certainly not impossible. And nowhere is that more true than in higher ed, uh, where we've been debating on the merits of online education for years, for example, and suddenly every university in the country and, and most in the world have pivoted to online experiences in an unheard of amount of time. Uh, the futures work that I do is critical, postmodern, cultural, interpretive, participatory, and holistic, which is to say that we're really concerned with questions of power. Who gets to decide what the future is? Uh, one futurist that I follow and a, a book I highly recommend, if you're interested, it's called The Big Nine. It's by a futurist named Amy Webb. And The Big Nine is really a book about her uh, analysis that some of the biggest questions on the future of humanity are being decided by the boards of directors of nine global corporations, tech corporations. She calls them the G Mafia. There's six in the United, uh, excuse me, five, uh, I'm sorry, six in the United States and three in China. The ones in the United States, she calls the G Mafia, Google, Microsoft, Intel, right? The ones you know, and then three in China. She essentially says, you know, nine corporations and their boards should really not be deciding the future of humanity. Uh, that should be a more democratic process. So uh, when I say critical or postmodern, it really is about issues of power and who gets to decide, who gets to participate in the co-construction of the world. And then a very deep bow to an indigenous lens where a lot of futures thinking has its origins. So thinking ahead, thinking about our obligation to future generations is at its best an indigenous concept. Uh, it's obviously expanded from there, but um, it really needs to be acknowledged. So futures of work and practice is a newish discipline. It's newer than sociology, for example, but it does have more than a 50 year history. We, we talk about it as an emerging social science. 
Um, futures thinking and practice is about managing exponential change. So often when we think about the way things will change or the way we have prepared for change in previous generations, we've tended to prepare for it in sort of a linear way, like I'd like to go over there and so I will develop a plan to get there. Uh, change now is exponential. It's, it's things are changing faster and they're changing with more variables than at any other time in history. It isn't linear. A perfect example is how Portland State University is planning and every university is planning about how they're going to manage the fall. We have to plan for five different things, at least simultaneously, different ways of opening. Uh, everything from completely online to back to the way it was before and many other variations. And we have to prepare for all those things simultaneously. That is the sort of exponentially complex way in which all planning is really being done. And that was happening actually before COVID, but it's especially, uh, I don't want to say aggravated, but shaped by that. Futures thinking is a philosophy, a set of tools and skills. Uh, there are literally thousands, if not tens of thousands of people around the world who are practicing futurists. They are operating as futurists. They make their living being futurists. Um, in a variety of traditions, there's many different traditions of futures practice. They work in the public sector. There's a whole sort of corporate angle. Most big multinational corporations have a futurist working for them. And I will admit to you that as much as I love uh, Portland State, I did get tempted by a corporate futurist job in, uh, for the Lego Corporation. I just thought being a futurist for the Lego Corporation might be like the most fun job ever. But anyway, I didn't, I stayed at PSU as you can well see. Anyway, public sector also, there's uh, more so in, uh, in other countries, we don't do it as much here, but that's starting to change. Uh, whole teams of futurists working in government. I had a chance to visit Finland on my sabbatical this year where I got to meet, uh, Finland has had a global futures uh, advisory committee and research institute that's been operating for more than 50 years. So Finland's social policy and national policy is very much informed by a team of futurists that consider various ramifications of different policy options. Um, it's a very transdisciplinary type of work. So when I go to a futures conference, I'm likely to see people who are working on the future of food, the future of climate, the future of driving, the future of technology, the future of grieving and spirituality, all interacting at one gathering. But what we have in common is that we're all talking about the future of a thing we're passionate about. And then interestingly, the way the future of those things will interact. Um, so what futures work is and isn't and a, a slight critique. So futures work isn't about predicting uh, and futurists get really squirmish when, we, uh, when we're asked for predictions. But what we do is more like map making and navigating. We take in a lot of information and we try to organize it in ways that have people make more foresightful decisions. Um, it's not about controlling the future, that's not possible. Uh, the futures folks I hang around with are not about dominating the sector with one voice or one vision. Again, back to the tech idea. Tech is an extraordinary uh, sector and resource, but should it be making the decisions for everybody in every sector? Probably not, right? It should have a voice, a very important voice, but maybe not the only voice. Uh, futures thinking isn't driven by one current economic or political framework or goals. Futures work can sometimes be criticized for being elitist or being sort of white supremacy, white embedded with a lot of whiteness um, or blinded by that. Um, and I think that is an important critique um, and that's changing increasingly so that more people around the world and more social locations and more identities, um, more diversity and more schools of social or futures work are um, uh, entering the space. I ascribe, as I said, to a critical futures thought, uh, futures work that's very pluralist, that's disruptive, very network-based, human and sustainability-centered. For me, the purpose of futures work, and it's actually part of the futures code of ethics, is that futures work should benefit the future of humanity, not benefit an individual, uh, but benefit the future of humanity. There's constant power analysis that's part of this. 
um, again, back to that question, who gets to define the future? And a lot of futures work that I engage in is about democratizing this futures thought and practice. So elites in the world have been using futures thought. In fact, that's really where it came from for a long, long time. But the truth is, it's not enough for just a few people to make those decisions. We need as many people as possible thinking and operating like futurists. So the toolkit um, is uh, colloquially referred to as the P's, discovering and imagining probable futures as well as even preposterous futures. So using our imaginations, taking advantage of, a, of the probable and the possible future, but also steering towards the preferable. We always wanna get to what is the future we want how do we move ourselves and our society towards that future and away from the futures we don't want? Uh, so if you watch The Handmaid's Tale or you watch, uh, uh, you know, uh, what is the Mockingjay, Hunger Games, those are not futures we probably want, right? <laughs> we watch those, but those aren't futures we want. I'm more interested in more of a Star trek -y future, right? Where we're exploring and sharing and benefiting uh, humanity together. Um, so signals are part of the toolkit. Uh, signal work is a practice, uh, not a behavior or a parlor game. It's about monitoring global, continuous, iterative um, signposts that things are changing. A signal is a little like a trend. Um, so there's a lot of trend analysis that goes on. Um, and I'll go back to technology. What are some of the technologies of the future? Well, one of the ways we, we learn about the technologies of the future is to study the trends right now. What's trending right now in technology? But trends are something that's already happened, whereas a signal is something that's just a little indicator around the edges that something big is shifting. Um, and you look for signals around the edges of society, not from sort of the main uh, powerful voices. You stay very conscious about official futures or used futures, which, is a, which are the futures that powerful entities try to hand down. Uh, futurists are always looking for unofficial or emergent futures. Um, scenarios allow us to play out how different combinations of signals might play out. Um, the classics are that futurists use. What if things get better? What if things get worse? What if things stay the same? Or what if some sort of transformation occurs? And the mark of a transformation is that it's so creative that it's almost beyond our capacity to understand what it might look like. So let's go back to COVID and say, what if things get uh, wildly better? What if somehow the, the cure or the vaccine for COVID ends up uh, actually doing something really bigger for, for health, but the, the, uh, the, the economy pops back and it's stronger than ever and more healthcare is provided to more people and things get better. Um, but sort of in the same playbook that we had before, things get worse. Obviously, not only we can't find a vaccine, but the COVID begins to mutate and lots of other sort of problems occur. Things stay the same. Well, we kind of just keep opening and closing and bouncing around all the time, kind of wandering around and bumping into things is the way I think of that scenario. And what if transformation occurs? Something that's almost beyond our capacity might be, what if the vaccine for COVID ends up curing cancer? Or what if we get to a truly different kind of economic framework um, in our country that moves beyond what we've always known it to be that's more in line with the, the betterment of humanity? Um, these are all different ways that we play around with scenarios and we help people imagine, well, of, of all those, what are the ingredients of those scenarios? Which ones do we want? Which ones do we not want? And what do we need to do to bring uh, the scenario that we want to life and to keep the scenario we don't want as far away from us as possible? And then there's lots of change frameworks. So lots of tools and games to play. And so futures practice is very much about getting groups of people to become more creative, intelligent, and agile through learning together and sometimes learning very hard topics, complex topics. So a lot of futures work is about games and play, helping people learn through play. Partly because the idea is that opening, you know, learning, uh, the best kind of learning happens when we open up our creativity. And that happens when we're playing, not when we've sort of got our head down in the book. So this is also along the lines of sort of the future of learning. So Amy Webb, the person I mentioned who wrote the big, uh, uh, the big Nine, 
um, is a futurist that I follow. She's done a lot of really interesting work and she talks about um, macro sources of disruption. Um, so this is also a, a way that futurists organize themselves. And if you could sort of imagine, so for the time being, we'll say PSU is the center of this, but your organization or some group that you care about might be the center. Technology is that inner ring that the technology is changing so fast and making so many things accelerate simultaneously. Technology is always going to be a disruptor and kind of a central disruptor to the way things are. But then around the edges, you have things like wealth distribution, education, infrastructure, government, geopolitics, the economy, public health, demographics, the environment, media and communications. Each of these areas is also changing, moving, almost like molecules, just vibrating in the world, changing dynamically. And amazingly, not only are they moving in their own space, but they're interacting with each other. So in futures work, when I do day long or multi-day trainings with people, and as we get people foresight trained, we do a lot of work helping people imagine what are the big shifts that are happening in wealth distribution and education and infrastructure, having people go deep into thinking about those. But then we have them intersect with each other. So what, is, what are trends we're seeing in wealth distribution, education, and geopolitics? How are those things intersecting? Or right now, public health is really dominating everything at the moment. Um, public health and sort of uh, geopolitics or demographics in terms of the racial justice issues we were talking before. Uh, not only are these items individually disruptive, but they are disruptive in pairs and combinations um, that are almost impossible to predict, but not impossible to imagine. And so it is that imagining that builds our future's muscles. And that's what foresight practice is. It's about building our muscles to be more agile and creative in anticipating more effectively and then preparing for different scenarios at the same time. Um, if I were, this is a, a wonderful uh, image from one of our futures books, but um, you know, I, I often do uh, it when I'm in a real room with people and had I been with you all today, I might have had you do this, have people actually stand on a line. We all come to this work and this thinking looking at that vertical uh, axis. The world is getting better and the world is getting worse. And if I were to ask you all uh, on this call to stand on an imaginary line with those of you who are just incredible optimists and believe, oh my gosh, the world is getting better all the time. And those of you who are the worst of the pessimists and you believe, no, the world is getting worse. And those of you who stand in the middle, we all come to this work somewhere on that continuum. Uh, but the truth is, we also also have this other axis. I'm able to influence the future versus I'm not able to influence the, the horizontal axis there. And um, if I were to ask you to all stand on that, our goal with futures work is not to do away with anyone's pessimism per se, but to push people up into that left hand corner. Because the truth is, there's plenty of evidence that the world is getting better. Even with all the problems that we have, there's lots of evidence the world is getting better. There's also lots of evidence the world is getting worse. <laughs> Both coexist. Um, and so uh, the idea is to boost our capacity to influence the future uh, and to grow the positive dynamics. That's, that's really what we're trying to do um, in futures work. So, there's a lot of very cool principles of the future. There's a beautiful um, literature to this. Um, I love these from Daniel Bankston. We've used a lot of these in the uh, PSU collaboratory. Just wanna check the time here, how we doing? Good. Um, the future is plural. Many scenarios are possible and that's a really cool and good thing. Um, there isn't just one way the future might play out. There are many possibilities. The future is a combination of alternative futures, possible futures, plausible, probable and preferable, and even that preposterous future. The future is open, not fixed. It's fuzzy. Of course, we can't know exactly how it will turn out, so our foresight is always imperfect and limited. The future is surprising. It's not always smooth or continuous. Sometimes it arrives in unexpected ways, and we've seen a lot of that in the last few months, haven't we? But the future is also not surprising. And sometimes the future is boring. So Anthony Fauci might say, I'm not that surprised uh, by what's happened with COVID-19 uh, because uh, we've been telling you that was coming for a long time. The future is fast. 
The future is always accelerating, but the future is also slow. Uh, accelerating change gets all the attention, but a balance of the future is also slow, plotting, and predictable. And a lot of my folks and a lot of my friends and colleagues in climate change work might say, climate change is a slow process. We'll start to feel uh, at certain moments some cascading effects, but the truth is climate change is a slow tragedy uh, that we're trying to, to change. Um, so these are sort of principles that we work with. Um, and good futurists are amazingly able to hold all of these ideas in their minds at the same time. We love these so much that um, this image, which was actually developed by a PSU uh, student, this is our logo for the PSU Futures Collaboratory, the work that we're doing here at Portland State on this issue. Um, and we've made sort of our, our hashtag, the future is plural. Isn't it beautiful? So that was really written, uh, developed by a student as she heard from us, a graphic design student. So we're super proud of that. Um, eventually we'll have t-shirts when we all get together and do things like uh, wear t-shirts together. Um, so more on futures thinking in general. The, the image on the left is from a conference I went to um, this last year on the future of medicine. And I loved it because it does sort of feel sometimes like here comes the future and a narrative where we're a little tiny boat and it's coming at us. The future is the wave. And we all know how this is going to turn out, right? It's sort of a depressing and not particularly empowered way to think about the future. There are aspects of the future that may be true. Um, we don't control, for example, a virus. The virus is in control. Uh, but there's a lot we can do to push back. And the history of humanity is that our pushing back has often been very effective. Uh, even if it doesn't control it uh, thoroughly, I mean, have the ability to sort of do away with it, there's a lot we can do to push it back. So the narratives matter. And narratives we're trying to promote in Futures work is the idea more of a kayak. Uh, the idea that traditional levers, like in the image on the left, like just working the wind probably isn't going to help you survive that wave, right? The wave is coming on faster. The tempo is dictated by the risks we're facing. So kayaking, more of the idea of moving with change, um, success is messy and boosting our collective intelligence to, to use collective action is the idea of, of a deeper level of competence with futures work. There's even people who work on the future of power and say that we're really changing. The world is changing very much from a hierarchy-based sort of way of understanding power to more distributed power, from hierarchies to networks. And, uh, and not just one kind of network. The image on the right shows lots of different kinds of networks. The fabulous book called The Future of Power that I highly recommend. Um, and it's not ideological. There's both uh, progressive and conservative ways that these network shifts are happening um, and are, are playing out on the news every day. So fascinating. When I go to a futures meeting and even in the futures collaboratory, we're looking at the future of issues. So we're looking at the future of social change, the future of work, the future of organizational life. A big issue right now is the future of cities and smart cities. I talked to two different colleagues um, earlier today who said they were moving out of New York City. And there's a lot of literature about what is the future of cities given what's happening? Will people want to live in cities anymore? Um, the future of technology, obviously of climate, of food, communication, identity and human rights, the future of racism and equity, the future of family life, the future of coupling and relationships. There's, I, I was at a, a couple of weeks ago, I had probably 20 different things on my Twitter feed about the future of sex <laughs> because of COVID-19. And when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense that it's a very complicated time to be dating or coupling or relating to other human beings, um, given some of the limitations uh, that are upon us. The future of well-being, including both health and psychological well-being, the future of religion and spirituality the future of trust, the future of political life and democracy, the future of war, and the future of peace, and then not to mention the future of every kind of project, product imaginable. I don't know why it keeps popping back. So there's future of issues, and then there's also lots of future of professions. So there's an enormous amount of work going on in the future of medicine. I love this book on the right. It's one of the most interesting, couldn't put it down kind of 
books I think I've ever read. Uh, partly because I think of my, so my identity is very much wrapped up in the idea of myself as a professional. And I, I have to admit, I never gave much thought to what is the future of the professions? What is the deeper social contract related to the professions? And how does things like ubiquitous availability of information challenge what professions have always done and how it may change that in the future? Their point, the sus kinds in this book, is what's the role of artificial intelligence in the future of the professions? What's the future of education, both K-12 and higher ed? What's the future of, of law, of journalism, of architecture, the future of divinity? So there's deep work, experts, research, theorizing, thought leadership going on in all of these spaces, the future. So that image I went to, I've actually been to a, a big, a couple of big meetings on the future of medicine and several on the future of higher education, utterly fascinating and uh, lots of interesting work going on in those spaces. Um, algorithmic racism, in the Futures Collaboratory, we just had uh, uh, Ruha Benjamin come in and, and speak to us, and I'll make sure that you actually get a link to the webinars we just did so you can hear her. She's a futurist and a, a Princeton uh, faculty member um, who looks at racism embedded in technology. She says, with emerging technologies, we might assume that racial bias will be more scientifically rooted out. Yet rather than challenging or overcoming the cycles of inequity, technical fixes too often reinforce or even deepen the status quo. She calls this the new gym code or coded inequity where racism then becomes doubled, magnified and buried under layers of digital denial. So preparing ourselves for the future and preparing ourselves for a technology that we want means acknowledging that this is happening and she has her whole scholarship is dedicated to this particular area. There's a whole emerging area of ethics in the future. And again, a sort of obligation to future generations. This is um, a wonderful product out of the organization I'm also affiliated with, the Institute of the Future, called Ethical OS, or Ethical Operating Systems. Um, Jane McGonigal, one of the uh, futurists that works at IFTF, uh, refers to this as the tool that helps us not regret the things we build. Uh, but the, at, at the end of the day, there's enormous ethics work going on, ethics development work going on, because frankly, the things we're working on, the things we're building and producing, we don't necessarily have pre-existing ethical guidelines to contain them all. This is happening in the future of medicine as well. Uh, but these are, this is a wonderful free tool that, in, that it explores things like truth, disinformation, and propaganda, addiction, and the dopamine economy, economic and asset inequalities, machine ethics and algorithmic biases, the surveillance state, data control and monetization, implicit trust and use and understanding, and then hateful and criminal actors. So important, really beautiful work that's going on to help equip us. These are also things that futurists bring into the space. So in futures work, we talk a lot about a VUCA world and post-normal times. We were talking about this before COVID, but now people think we're really smart that we could see this coming. The truth is VUCA is a concept that's been around for 20 years or so. And it's the idea that the world is getting increasingly volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And that futures practice is what helps us make sense of that and find pathways through that. Volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Um, if it seems like it's getting weirder out in the world, it is. And the post-normal times idea is the idea that we're literally between um, sort of ethos. We're, we're, we're in between big, big changes in historical eras um, that are coming on faster and faster. Leaders, and Bob Johansson is a previous director of IFTF, talks about this, one of the central challenges for leaders is to flip from a frightening VUCA, of that volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, to a hopeful VUCA, a vision, understanding, clarity, and agility. But this is the ultimate dilemma for leaders of the future, um, and what we hope uh, our leaders acquire. So as we're working on this future graduate certificate, um, we're very much hoping that we'll be able to create a year-long pro course of study that any leader might be able to pick up from any discipline. And in fact, the more multidisciplinary, the, the better. What we're trying to do with futures training 
and futures leadership cultivation is help, um, again, equip people to navigate more effectively what's happening, to not use yesterday's tools on tomorrow's challenges. Uh, this is a, another map of sort of those P's, the preposterous, the possible, the plausible, the projected future, the probable future, and the preferable future. And the idea of trying to make our minds more elastic um, and think beyond now into the future is a lot of what futures thinking is all about. So I'm not going to have time to go through all of these terms, but I just wanted to uh, expose you um, to a few more uh, futures terms. Algorithmic racism is one I've already shared with you. Design justice, um, Afrofuturism, queer feminist or crip futures, Latinx futures, indigenous futures, digital justice, degrowth, calm technology, the global brain, resilience hubs, cyborg anthropology, terrific TED talk on that by a futurist named Amber Case that we work with. By the way, she says that because of our phones, we're all cyborgs now, sorry to disappoint you. Hello, fellow cyborgs. Um, Panopticon, which is a state of always being watched. It's a society in which everyone is watched all the time. Synthetic humans, which is the most sophisticated level of thinking beyond robotics to truly digital synthetic humans. Just read this morning that uh, some multi-million dollar contract was just given to a synthetic human actor for a movie. Uh, that's a real thing. And then Democracy 2.0, what's the future of democracy? So people actively talking about and working in that space. All of these topics were being discussed in depth before COVID. Uh, and of course, they will be complicated and will proceed in some unexpected and, unex uh, and expected and unexpected ways. Many people are saying uh, COVID and this racial justice uh, moment that we're having is accelerating a lot of pre-existing sort of future of work, for example, um, trends, et cetera, that a lot of these things are gonna come on faster. Uh, because of what's happening. The most important questions for PSU right now is what does being ready for the future mean for our university? Uh, what does it mean in general? For what does it mean for higher ed? And what does the future, and for PSU specifically, what does the future need from universities? What do universities of the future look like? How are they like and unlike what we do right now? What's most important to protect as evolution devolution threats and opportunities inevitably happen, uh, but also what's probably important to let go of. What are different scenarios for how the future might play out, including positive ones, negative ones, transformational ones, and how can we plan for several of them simultaneously? So this is us at work in our Futures Collaboratory. Um, so our, we practice things like helping us deepen and strengthen our ability to anticipate and imagine in new ways, uh, it helped us commit to reducing short-termism, though we have to manage that uh, in both our immediate and extended circles of influence. Um, we explored how futures thinking can help us make better decisions and think through things like unintended consequences and underdeveloped possibilities. Um, it's helped us resist powerful actors who dictate what the future is going to be in favor of increasing agency and democracy in co-creating what that future might be. Um, and, and it helped us really acknowledge that, that future building is not neutral. It's powerful, even at PSU, who gets to decide that future? Is it a democratic process? So um, this is, uh, uh, this particular slide is geared of a lot of work that's being done on future proofing um, evolution, the evolution of higher ed. Uh, people are looking at such things as the purpose of higher ed. Is it evolving? Is the purpose of higher education changing? The social legitimacy, is you, are universities and higher ed trusted? Are we valued the same way as we were even five years ago? And how will that continue to evolve? Education work, uh, higher ed is evolving as a type of work. How will roles of faculty, roles of administrators, even roles of students change in the coming years? How will higher ed change as it's part of a global community? And how geopolitics will shape our local realities? Uh, obviously thinking about things like uh, students from other countries, international students. We're also in a hostile historical period for knowledge work. 
Um, and I think we haven't often talked about that enough out loud, but they're really talking about it in the futures world. It's an intense time to be a producer of knowledge, particularly someone who's connected to science right now at this moment in history. It is a science unfriendly period of history, uh, not just here in the United States, but in many places around the world. And then of course, now is a site of deep COVID complexity, everything from housing to small classrooms to a digital divide, revealed precarious funding streams, other types of COVID related equity and inequity. Again, what is the university's role and PSU's role specifically? What's our emerging role in recovery uh, of Portland, of our region? And I believe we have a deep one and a strong one. So our collaboratory has been going for the last year. Um, it's a presidential initiative a brought to reality by interim president Percy in the summer of 2019. Our activity was to bring a cross section of people together from across our campus. Um, our goals were to build a cross disciplinary future ambassador team to do exploratory projects based on our ideas and deliver a list of ideas to interim president Percy about what we recommend to increase PSU's future readiness in the years to come. We've just completed that um, and we're actually just meeting with Steve in a couple of weeks to present those recommendations and then we'll post them on our website. Um, our, our interim report uh, is that we have internationally known futurists engaging with us. We have developed a thrively, lively, and committed group. Um, we have lots of projects, lots of learning, a lot of big thinking. Our group has been curious, committed, active, and engaged. And I'd love you to visit our website. You'll have these slides, but this is the link to the website where you can get um, into all our information. And we ended our year doing three wonderful webinars, and those are fully available for you to see. So I'll make sure that you get sent the link uh, to those, but they're here in this slide as well. Um, I want to say that when things were getting really um, busy and uncertain with COVID, we actually upped the number of meetings that we had. Our Futures Collaboratory met more during the pandemic initial stages than uh, before uh, because we wanted to connect and we wanted to share and learn and we realized, wow, everything we've been talking about is suddenly so much more real and so much more valid than we could have imagined. Um, this is all us and that there, there we are. Remember those, does that make you just think uh, with such reverence about, remember when we used to get in rooms and stand near each other? <laughs> and then on the left is uh, us uh, working online together. Um, this was our webinars. Uh, we had one on what futures thinking is in practice. Uh, we had some scenarios for PSU's future and a lot of sharing in those first few webinars about just our experiences in the webinar. And then uh, Ruha did her third, uh, the third webinar on race to the future, reimagining the digital default set settings of tech and society. So um, in closing, uh, our work has really been about thinking about what kind of story we'll write about what happens next. We believe strongly that a thriving PSU belongs in Portland and in our region's future, uh, contributing, learning, and co-creating. But of course, that, that will only happen if we prepare to be part of a new story. Probably having exactly the same story we've always had isn't the only or best option. We'll have to um, flex, evolve. And uh, our goal with the collaboratory is to continue it into next year and subsequent years, Rep represent uh, even more faculty, student, and staff voices, and grow our capacity at PSU to participate uh, in the future in new ways um, and boost our vibrancy, but also, again, boost that collective imagination, intelligence, and agility through learning and growing together. So with that, I think that is all my slides. I'll just leave that one up, and then I'd love to just open it up to questions and dialogue. I think I'm going to get to the chat. Thank you so much, yeah. Laura. That was fascinating and very interesting and a lot of new information.